Okay, welcome everybody. I'm Jonathan Zeitlin. I'm the academic director of the Amsterdam Center for European Studies, uh, which is organizing this event. We're really uh, delighted to be able to present uh, this discussion of the, uh, the new book by uh, Frédéric Miron, uh, the uh, political commissioner um, and ethnography of the, uh, the European uh, Commission, which is just out, I think, from Oxford University Press in English. It appeared earlier this year in French from uh, Press uh, de Science uh, Po. And um, I mean, I, you'll hear from the other discussants about uh, what a great book this is, but I just want to say that it is one of the few books on contemporary European politics and certainly on the European Commission that is really hard to put down. It reads uh, like a novel while at the same time still being uh, quite uh, analytical. So let me uh, briefly introduce the, the speakers. Um, Frédéric Miron is the director of uh, CERIUM, that's the Montreal Center for International Studies, and he's also a professor of political science at the University of Montreal. Uh, he's published uh, quite extensively books and articles, um, mostly, I would say, on uh, European security and defense uh, policy, but also on aspects of transatlantic uh, relations on Canadian foreign policy and the sociology of international relations. And that I, I think makes it all the more impressive uh, that he's taken on um, uh, economic and financial policy making uh, in the, uh, the European uh, Commission. Now we have three uh, discussants, uh, probably who are uh, all very well known to this audience. And I'm I'm happy that I see so many uh, friends and distinguished colleagues from around uh, Europe uh, in, the, in the audience. So the first discussion is going to be Vivian Schmidt. She's a Jean Monnet Professor of European Integration and Professor of International uh, Relations and Political Science at Boston University. She's also the founding director there of BU Center for the Study of Europe. And among her many publications, I will just mention one, which is her 2020 book also with uh, Oxford, uh, Europe's Crisis of Legitimacy, um, Governing by Rules and Ruling by Numbers in the Eurozone. And it covers very much the same period, um, maybe a longer period than Frederick's book. And so the two, the two books in a way fit together as part of a larger uh, puzzle. Uh, our second discussant is uh, Eric Jones, who's Professor of European Studies and International uh, Political Economy at uh, Johns Hopkins Science um, uh, Bologna. And he's about to become the uh, director of the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies at the European University Institute. Uh, he's also written very widely on different aspects of um, European political economy and integration. Uh, I'll just mention the Oxford Handbook of the EU, which he uh, co-edited, and um, a title which he probably regrets called, uh, of a book called The Year the European Crisis Ended, which came out in 2014. And uh, last, but by no means least, um, uh, we have Christian Rao, um, who is a political scientist in the Global Governance Unit um, of the Weizsäger Bay uh, Berlin Social Science uh, Center. And among uh, other things, uh, he's written about um, politicization and decision-making and responsiveness in the European uh, Commission. And I want to draw people's attention if you don't already know it, to his excellent book, A Responsive Technocracy, EU Politicization um, and the con and Consumer Policies of the European Commission, published by ECPR Press in 2016. So here's the, uh, the format. Frederic will have 20 minutes to introduce the book, I think with a few slides. Uh, then uh, in the order I introduced them, the discussants will each have seven uh, minutes to make some comments or ask some questions to Frederick. He'll have three minutes to respond to each of them 
in sequence, and then uh, we'll open up to you, the audience. Um, I, uh, in, you can put your um, questions uh, in the chat, or you can raise your hand uh, virtually. And if time permits, I will call on you and let you, uh, you know, share your screen and, and speak, so that we can have the feeling that we're in uh, a, a global seminar and not each in our Zoom monad. Okay, Frederic, let me give you the the, uh, the floor or the Zoom screen, so to speak. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for your kind words. Uh, the last time I was at the Amsterdam Center for European Studies was uh, for a workshop organized by Teresa Kuhn and uh, Francesco Nicoli. And although it is very uh, much fun to meet with you in this uh, global uh, Zoom, as you said, uh, I do miss uh, the restaurant that uh, we went to that time, which I enjoyed a lot. So I am Hi, everybody in Amsterdam and elsewhere. Uh, it's a real honor to be uh, here with you and to have my book discussed by such eminent scholars. Um, Jonathan mentioned that I, I used to work on security and defense policy, so it was quite a bit challenge to get acquainted with economic policy. And Eric Jones' Twitter account is where I turn to when I need to understand something about complicated uh, economic uh, issues. So uh, he's been a, an important source uh, for me. Uh, same thing with uh, Vivian Schmidt, whose book came out at the same time. It's very much the mirror of, I think, uh, of, uh, of my argument. Um, and, and it's also a, a book that, um, and you know, Vivian Schmidt's work in general, that I can relate to theoretically. So it's al also been an important source of influence. And although Christian, uh, we, we got to know each other there a bit um, late in the game, as far as, as I was uh, concerned, I really, really uh, think that uh, his work on, on politicization and the commission is amazing because it connects together the literature on public opinion, which is very important, and on the institutions, which is what I'm, uh, I've been mostly uh, working on. So thank you for, for, being, for being here. I'll, I'll share my screen to show you a few uh, pictures of um, the, the book and try and illustrate the main arguments. So that's the cover of the book, which is coming out in a series edited by Gary Marx and Elisabeth Uge at the Oxford University Press. So uh, first of all, why did I write this book? Uh, in uh, 2014, right when uh, Eric was saying that the crisis was, uh, was ending in, in Europe, uh, Jean-Claude Juncker appointed Pierre Moscovici uh, as his commissioner for economic and financial affairs, taxation, and uh, the customs uh, union. And a few weeks later, I wrote uh, what I call my message in a bottle. I wrote an email to uh, his uh, chef de cabinet, who I didn't know, asking him if I uh, could uh, do some kind of uh, observation in uh, his uh, cabinet. This is something that I've uh, been doing with a lot of people before. It had never worked. My dream has always been to replicate George Ross's uh, famous study of the Delors Commission at the turn of uh, the 90s. But to my great uh, surprise, uh, a few weeks later, I received a phone call from Olivier uh, Bailly, who's the chef, who was the chef de cabinet to Pierre Moscovici here on your left, who basically said that they agreed and that they received approval from the 13th floor, that is uh, the president's uh, office, for me to spend some time in, um, in the cabinet. So in July 2015, I joined the Moscovici cabinet uh, with the official title of atypical trainee, atypical uh, stagiaire, that's how they could fit me in uh, the system. So the first ta task, I'm sorry, was to get accepted, not so much by the commissioner, but by, by the team. And I didn't know how much access uh, I would have. And perhaps to uh, our uh, collective surprise, um, uh, I managed to stay until the very end of, of the mandate. And from that experience, uh, so from 2015 to 2019, I wrote what I call an ethnographic uh, narrative uh, about an exciting time, I think, in uh, European history um, when, when uh, the crisis was turning into a uh, poly uh, crisis. So that's basically uh, the gist of the book. 
But perhaps I should explain uh, the title of the book, Why the Political uh, Commissioner, a European Ethnography. Well, the first thing is that the book is an ethnography in the sense that it's based on an embedded observation of uh, the commission, uh, where I spent basically two months a year for uh, almost five years. It, it is an in inductive uh, kind of work. Uh, it, I didn't start with a research question, really. I, I, I worked as an ethnographer and tried to abstract away at the end of the uh, book some, some ideas that may be relevant for uh, political science. It is a situated uh, ethnography, and I, I really want to emphasize that. I'm basically following or shadowing a commissioner and his cabinet, about 15 people uh, who work with him. And to give you an idea of how situated um, this, this project was, I show you a picture of the entrance of the Moscovici cabinet. So when you come out of the elevator on the 10th floor of the Berlimont building, uh, the commission headquarters in Brussels, uh, you see the entrance of the Moscovici cabinet and, and the staffers have put on the wall or had put on the wall a work of art, uh, which uh, says in a kind of ironic and, and uh, slightly uh, euphemistic way, uh, what was the identity of the cabinet? So it's a cabinet that was working on economic issues, to be sure. It was a cabinet that was led by a French commissioner, and that's, a, that's quite uh, important. Um, and it's a cabinet that was led by a socialist commissioner. Uh, and so here there's a joke, but it, it, it's a joke that says a lot. When nothing goes right, go left. So the, the identity of the cabinet as a left-leaning cabinet was, um, was uh, quite uh, important. So this means that when I talk about the uh, commission, I don't talk about the commission in general. I don't talk so much about the commission in the greater ecosystem of Brussels. I talk about what I saw from my perch uh, on the 10th floor of the Berlimont, surrounded by uh, mostly French-speaking, mostly left-leaning uh, cabinet members and a commissioner working on economic um, uh, policy. So who were these people? Um, I call them the Moscows uh, in the sense that there is, uh, as people who follow the commission know, a kind of um, uh, um, identification between uh, the people or the team and, and the commissioner uh, himself or herself, as the case may be. But inside this group, I basically distinguished two, uh, two groups that turned out to be uh, quite significant, not only uh, institutionally and politically, but also as socially, uh, so to speak. The first group is who I call the Brussels people, and the other group I call uh, the Parisians. Why? The Brussels people are mainly um, commission uh, officials, some of them could be French, others uh, from different nationalities, who basically uh, are invested in the European project, have a European uh, career, and although they may be uh, left-leaning, uh, Europe matters more than uh, partisan identity for them. The other group, uh, I call the Parisians, were mostly people who came with the commissioner from Paris, who had a completely different uh, trajectory before. They, usually had studied with French Grande École as opposed to, for example, the College of Europe. Um, they had worked in uh, cabinet, uh, in ministerial cabinets in Paris. Uh, they were close to the Socialist Party. And so they came to Brussels to do uh, politics. And these two groups had different uh, views on uh, what should be done. It doesn't mean that they were opposed to each other at all. I mean, they, they had friendly relations, but they had different uh, sensitivity or sensibility, if you like. Um, so here we see the commissioner on Place Flagey in Brussels with two of the Brussels people, uh, Simon and uh, Leila, uh, with typical European uh, trajectories, uh, different nationalities, speaking different languages. You, you, you know what it's like. Uh, but the important point here that I want also to mention it, is that in the book, I use people's first names uh, with their uh, approval. So uh, the book really follows uh, these about 15 individuals as uh, they um, as they lived the European uh, project for five years with great hopes sometimes and also great uh, disappointments. So uh, maybe another important point about uh, the book's title is that um, given that it's, it's, uh, it's a situated ethnography, I don't claim to have a bird's eye view on 
on the European Commission. And I am not interested in the commissioner per se. Uh, it, it is not, uh, I am not his hagiographer. Um, what I'm interested in is understanding how European politics is done from this particular angle that I had access to. Here I, 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 I'm sharing two pictures with you that give an idea of uh, what my position was as, as, a, as a researcher. I was always trying to be a bit in the background, so not in the center of the action, but at the same time trying to get as much uh, access as I could. So on the Greek, on the on the left side, you see a picture of the commissioner meeting with then Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras of Greece, and I'm standing behind the chef de cabinet Olivier, trying to take take notes, trying not to bother, but at the same time trying to get uh, as much uh, as I can. And on the right side, you see a picture of a of a, a typical uh, doorstep meeting with the press, where here I am uh, with my my my. Uh, my uh, tie, also trying to mix in uh, with, with the crowd, but not being uh, at the center of the attention. The focus of the book, and this is where I think there's a connection with uh, Vivian, Christian, and, and Eric's uh, work, is really on doing politics in Europe in an international organization. So I'm interested in the other side of politicization. There's a lot of literature now on public opinion, on the process of politicization. I'm more interested in the strategy adopted by people who wanted to politicize, as was the case with um, Commissioner uh, Moscovici. So the context in which I arrived in Brussels in 2015 was uh, the poly crisis, um, the commission's last chance. Uh, there was a lot of political commission talk on the part of President Jean-Claude Juncker and others. It turns out to be one aspect that I explore in the book, but it's not the only one that I'm interested in. What I'm interested in mostly is what I call political work. Uh, or international political work, that is, how do actors uh, try and sometimes succeed in pushing the boundaries of uh, political agency? So what are the boundaries of political agency? Uh, it's uh, basically the idea that there's a space in which different values uh, can be uh, expressed uh, and debated, in which choices can be made between uh, conflicting values. That's how basically I define uh, politics. And to me, it is interesting to uh, study uh, political work in uh, the EU because the EU is a place where it's not easy to do uh, politics. There are, as we know, very strong legal institutional constraints. You have the treaties. Uh, there are very strong diplomatic constraints, intergovernmental uh, dynamics, uh, which makes it hard uh, for uh, people to to make decisions based uh, on their um, values. So it's a book basically that tries to challenge uh, fatalism, the idea that everything's been written uh, in the treaties and in relations between uh, states. But it's also a book that shows the limits of the art uh, of uh, politics. Uh, politics is the freedom to choose, but it also entails a great deal of um, conflict. So I probably have like five minutes left. Uh, I will just go very quickly to give you uh, uh, quick illustrations of what I mean by uh, political work. Basically in the book, I follow on the, the files that were followed by, by the commissioner and his cabinet uh, um, themselves. And most of these files are known better to Vivian, Eric or Christian than they are uh, to me. But at the same time, I think it is interesting to see how these people on the 10th floor of, of the Bélémont were trying, uh, and sometimes I would argue succeeded, in expanding the scope for uh, political agency. So of course, one first uh, illustration that comes to mind is politics, as in party politics, as in campaigning, as in doing professional uh, politics, politics as a political game. And Commissioner Moscovici and a number of the people in his cabinet were definitely involved in that kind of politics. Uh, he was involved in French politics and European politics. He never hid the fact that he was a, a militant in his own uh, socialist party and also at the European level. So there's a chapter about that because it's interesting. I'm not sure uh, Commissioner Moscovici was uh, very typical of all the other commissioners, but that's certainly one definition we could give of doing politics at the European um, level. Perhaps more interesting is uh, the kind of politics or political work that they did in relation to Greece. I will not tell you the story of uh, the Greek crisis. It's, it's very long. It takes at least two chapters uh, of the book. But here I'm interested in how uh, the Moscovici's 
try to find what I call an alternative uh, inside the program or within the program. There was a program, austerity program, a memorandum applied to Greece. There wasn't a lot of room uh, for maneuver. But here I show you a picture of one of the meetings that I was able to attend here in uh, Athens with uh, Greek ministers, where basically you see the commissioner trying with the, the Greeks to find uh, places where they can allow the Greek government to make their own decision while uh, respecting uh, the conditions imposed by uh, the memorandum. The idea being that the commissioner, commissioner will then take uh, this back to Brussels and try to convince uh, the, the principals, uh, Germans and other member states, that they can trust the Greeks to some extent. So by definition, it is a very, uh, it is a kind of compromise. Uh, it is a very uh, unsatisfying compromise for most of the parties involved. But that's one definition that I give of politics. Politics as in finding alternatives, even when you, you're facing very strong constraints. Uh, other example, uh, very quickly, is uh, fiscal surveillance, uh, the application of, of the pact, which was also under Moscovici's uh, responsibility. Here I show a picture of my office, actually, uh, in, in, um, in the cabinet. Uh, and I was sharing this office with a secretary who was always putting uh, little uh, cakes and, and, and sweets um, at the entrance, which meant that everybody stopped all the time to just have normal conversations which I could uh, then listen to. Here you see three of the uh, advisors of the cabinet, an English one, a German one, and a French one. And they're, trying, and they're talking about how to deal with the difficult cases of uh, Spain and uh, Portugal, which were countries, as most of you will know, uh, that were breaking uh, the rules of the pact. But the commissioner didn't want to be too harsh on them because there was this idea that uh, the pact was basically stupid. And the commissioner wanted to uh, promote what he called a smarter version of the pact, which involved a lot of uh, political work, convincing on the one hand uh, countries like Germany that uh, sticking to the rules may not be the best uh, option, but at the same time putting enough pressure on countries like Spain and Portugal to make uh, some uh, reforms. Now, sometimes this political work turned out to be extremely uh, conflictual, and that's what happened with uh, Italy after the Cinque Stelle and the Lega came uh, to power, the idea was no longer let's try to find some room for discretion uh, in the pact. The idea was uh, trying to impose the European uh, Union's view on, uh, on Rome. Eric Jones knows a lot more about uh, this topic, but it was extremely interesting because here partisanship was quite in the open. You had a socialist commissioner who saw himself as a progressive, who uh, was a, uh, he's uh, the, the son of, of uh, Jewish uh, refugees uh, from World War II, uh, basically in conflict with what he saw as a uh, fascist uh, government. And that took place on Twitter, that took place in the European uh, Parliament. And that's where you could really see political work in the most uh, traditional sense uh, of, of the term. Another uh, example um, uh, is, is taxation, which is uh, similar to Eurozone reform in that uh, in both cases, uh, the commissioner tried to push for new ideas and faced a, a barrage or faced a wall uh, from, um, from the council, from certain member states in the council, from the famous New Hanseatic uh, League in, in the case of uh, Eurozone reform. Uh, and basically the idea here was trying to find allies, trying to engage public opinion against uh, the council with a limited uh, success. So I don't, you know, my time is running out. So I, I want to make sure that I can uh, finish on this uh, picture. The question that I ask at the end of the book is, um, was it an experiment or, or a an experience or, uh, or was it an experiment, I'm sorry, or a method in the sense, wh is what I saw really unique to Commissioner Moscovici and to the time that they were in, or is it something that we can draw lessons from uh, for, 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 for the pe present? At the end of the book, I gathered all the Moscovici's, the Moscow's in, in the Forêt de Soifang and at the outskirts of Brussels, and we read the book together and we talked about it. And it was very uh, clear to me that they were uh, 
conscious that they had failed on several files. Uh, they were disappointed by some of what they, they had done, by the compromises that they had made, by the compromissions that they had made sometimes also, for example, uh, on Greece. Um, but there was a kind of collective agreement that uh, doing politics uh, had been fun, had been worth it, um, that uh, it uh, requires uh, certain skills, it requires certain conditions that I talk about uh, uh, in, in the book. But there's one thing at the time in October 2019 that was completely missing from our radar and that was um, external shocks. So we talked about the many, many factors that were conducive to successful political work, but um, we were before the pandemic. And as you know, uh, the pandemic you know, basically uh, changed a lot of things, changed the paradigm, some would uh, argue. And I think that was uh, quite interesting for my project uh, as well, because here you had a new uh, president coming in, Ursula von der Leyen, who basically said she didn't want to do politics the way that Jean-Claude Juncker had said and given cover to Moscovici uh, to do. Uh, but, you know, the, the pandemic came, uh, the situation uh, creates winners and losers. And even when the commission no longer wanted to do uh, politics, uh, basically it was uh, brought back to this, um, this challenge. So I do think that the book, despite the fact that it ends in 2019, uh, carries some lessons for, uh, for our time, even though the situation um, has changed. So I'll, I'll stop here. And I'm really, really uh, looking forward to hearing what my esteemed colleagues have to, to say about uh, the argument or any uh, aspect of the book. Thank you for your attention. If you stop sharing your screen, uh, Federico. Yeah. Okay. Thanks uh, for that uh, wonderful introduction to the the book. It, you remind me that I meant to say at the the outset that people wanting to get um, the uh, the flavor of the argument uh, in a slightly more academic form can also turn to uh, Frederic's recent article in the Journal of European Public Policy on political work in the Stability and Growth Pact, which is certainly a great uh, coda or bookend to the, the book uh, itself. Okay, let me uh, now give um, the floor to, uh, to Vivian. So um, why don't you start? So uh, Jonathan, thank you for inviting me to comment. Frédéric, thank you for writing such a wonderful book. Um, I can only give it the highest praise. This is a book to the audience that you should not only read and absorb, but it's one that you should assign in all your classes on the EU. It's not only eminently readable, but insight insightful. It presents the commission in terms of its human side, the people in it, their strengths, their foibles, the constraints. And it also gives importantly, the background story. So we understand actors in context and over time. It's also, as Jonathan um, introduced us, it, it said initially, it's compelling reading. You can't put it down. As it stands, I see it as the best narrative of the Eurozone crisis so far in terms of governance. We get, but importantly, we get a lot on the economics and the problems of economic governments, governance from the outside. But we equally get a look inside the institutions in a sense from an outsider becoming an insider. But in addition, we get it a sense of from the outside of the institutions by an inside outsider, outsider assessing what happened and why. So it's really a fascinating read. You get everyday life in the cabinet of Pierre Moscovici. Um, in the beginning, we get an extremely good narrative, the Greek crisis, in particular the third Greek bailout in addition to having wonderful inside stories. And we also get the commission view. Most interesting, and I actually also got it when I had a part-time fellowship in the Directorate General of Economics and Finance, uh, it was a clear sense that the IMF was to blame for the hardest measures backed by the ECB, even though the, even though the story on the outside is that the commission was the bad guy. And that was constant. And when I asked, you know, how, how do you explain this? They said, well, they have much better propaganda than we do, <laughs> you know, better communication. 
But so what I think what Frederick does is provides an honest and complete account of what happened, how the commission and its commissioner and his cabinet uh, lived these five years, uh, especially during a time when the Eurozone crisis had slowed, but the Greek third Greek bailout was burning fast yet again. Um, and this is about the successes and disappointment of the commission. It's especially its inability to do much for Greece, even as attempted to soften the blows. But we also see its attempts to mitigate the worst of the governing by rules and ruling by numbers of the European semester for the non-program countries. So if we step back a minute and ask about theory, importantly, this is not a theory heavy book in terms of deductive explanations. It really is in the realm of sociology or, or even better anthropology, but there's no Levi Strauss here, no raw and the cooked <laughs> um, of the commission, no structuralist nor rationalist explanations. And thanks goodness. Um, we also see none of the EU studies battles over intergovernmentalism versus supranationalism. And again, thank goodness. What we get is demonstration of the political dynamics of interaction among the actors, especially the commission and the council in all its complexity. So this is, I think is really welcome uh, to get a, you know, sort of a view from the ground, a reality check on the way in which these institutions actually interact. Of course, we get it from the commission side, but that's actually even better. So we learn a lot about how the commission works and how individual agents assess their own actions, their agency and the situation. As such, Frederick himself says, this is an ethnography um, about the importance of understanding what really happened as opposed to theories seeking to explain why at a high level of abstraction. We're not at this high level of abstraction, we're really on the ground here. And as ethnography, this is bottom up, it's inductive rather than deductive. And as an embedded observer, Frédéric asks himself, can he maintain a critical stance? Is he going native? I don't think you actually use that term, but I like that. Is he going native? And, you know, I basically feel like it remains nicely native and not. He's critical and not. Um, this is this is you know success at telling a story, a narrative that weighs all the evidence, and discusses also the actor's own differing assent, assessments. So we get a sense of who these people are and how they view um, what's going on. Uh, Frédéric says this is about the sociology of work, um, and it's in particular a focus on political work with its many constraints, legal, diplomatic, and technical. So I remember, again, 2014-2015 on this part-time fellowship at DG ECFIN, I, spent a, I also spent a lot of time talking to high-level civil servants. Um, and when I pushed on how counterproductive the policies were, the response I, one sort of stands out, um, but Vivian, after all, rules are rules. You know, a clear sense of the constraints here. Um, so also this is very important, I think, on, on Frédéric's theoretical discussion of what it means to be political for the commission. But as Frédéric makes clear, while politics is constrained, it is not powerless. So then we've got to ask, what does the political mean? And Frédéric does a really nice job, I think, in the introduction um, talking about this. Um, but so what is political work? It's not just the politics of bureaucracy and technocracy, um, which would fit into, rationalists would say, self-interested politics. Um, because there's political will. This is about the power to, or the attempts, to do something with a set of ideas rather than just a focus on interest-based power. So it's ideational and discursive power, the power of persuasion. And we get a sense of how this works in coordination with other EU actors via networks of influence and in communication with the general public. So we get a sense how the commission itself is intent and Frank makes a real important point about this and illustrates it throughout. There's a focus on framing the debate and engaging with the media and civil society. In the end, however, we actually see how limited the commission's powers of persuasions are when it comes to Eurozone governance. So now, um, Although Frédéric attempts not to make normative judgments, I think we can make them because they actually emerge from the narrative. 
Uh, the commission, he says, preferred a smart, more flexible political interpretation of the rules laid down in the treaties, but it met major resistance from the German and Northern European co coalition. Um, and so it's clear that, that the commission actually has less control or little control of the, of, of the final product when it comes to the program countries, in particular um, uh, Greece, uh, than it does with the um, non-program countries. But you know, when I when I read this, when I ask myself, so who are these people? Um, in Berlimont, there's a kind of ambivalence. You know, they and this really comes out. They don't approve of the solutions, but it seems to me they're not taking responsibility. This is diffused. I think there's one quote. Well, this is our in response to Varoufakis. Well, this is our position, but we don't make the decisions alone. In my own book on legitimacy in the Eurozone crisis, I ask, is the council a dictatorship led by Germany or a mutually accountable deliberative body? What comes out clearly here in the program countries is in the third Greek bailout, this is, this is not just dictatorship, this is harsh dictatorship. And maybe it's deliberative authoritarian in the other bailout, uh, deliberative authoritarianism in the other bailouts. So I, in, in a way, I'm sorry to say, that Frédéric demonstrates this is very much a dictatorship by Germany and harsh at that in combination with the other Troika members. Um, and the commission, while more sympathetic, has little power to change that. So I've got to ask, is the commission, and these are the terms in my own book, ayatollahs of austerity or ministers of moderation? Frédéric's approach is mostly, and this has to do with the timing between 2015 and 2019, that these are really ministers of moderation, trying to interpret the rules, legitimate what they're doing, admitting to their flexibility, et cetera. So to conclude with questions, so my one major question comes back to responsibility. We hear over and over again that the commissioner did his best, that people in the commission were con in the cabinet were conscious of the limits, what they could do, the constraints. You know, I heard the same things over and over again when I was there. But I still want to ask, how do they live them with themselves at night, knowing that they were aiding in the implementation of actually highly destructive <laughs> policies? So what was the political commission? Not Arendt's banality of evil, but maybe the banality of bad compromisers, compromi compromises. Uh, whatever I do is okay, because this is my job. So question one is about legitimacy. And question two, much shorter, is about, um, because I don't want to end on a negative tone, is a, about lessons learned. And, but not simply lessons learned, but my question is, given everything that the commission did in those years, is it possible to give the commission credit for the kinds of new initiatives that we saw in response to COVID-19? Is it possible that all of their attempts to change the rules to get better solutions, which didn't work at the time, actually helped them understand what was going on now and made the commission a better place uh, and more capable of resolving the problems. So thank you. Sorry, I must've gone over a little. You did go over a little, it's about to, it's okay. Thanks, uh, Vivian. I mean, uh, Frederick, I'm very curious to hear the answer, your, your, your short answer uh, to Vivian, because I, I wonder, uh, having read the book myself, whether you would really accept the interpretation of the uh, the dynamics of the uh, the euro crisis whether the greek bailout or the uh, the european semester that uh, that vivian has just offered go ahead you need to unmute well i'll, I'll try to be very quick oh thank you very much uh, vivian i'm very humbled by your comments but the, the um, in in quickly to answer the two questions first what I find very interesting about the sense of responsibility in, in this mess is how first uh, cabinet members were quite reflexive about it uh, that you mentioned, but also were divided. And here the distinction that I made between two groups, the Brussels people and the Parisians is, is extremely useful in the sense that the Brussels people who tended to be more involved in the management of the file uh, tended to be also less uh, responsibility shirking 
uh, whereas the Parisians, who tended to be more left-wing, but also less involved in the management of the file, were extremely critical of what the Commission did uh, with regards to Greece. Uh, they say, and I quote it, uh, we were uh, accomplices to a social disaster. And, and so it was extremely interesting for me to listen to them debating with each other uh, inside the cabinet and also uh, at the end of the project um, uh, about this. Personally, I don't take a stand on, on, on it. Uh, on your second question about lessons learned, um, this is something that, of course, I, I wasn't thinking much about when I wrote the book, but since then I've been thinking about the extent to which uh, the, the Moscovici has prepared the groundwork uh, for uh, the discussions that we have now, because for, for, for the audience, uh, Eurozone reform in particular uh, is, is a total failure of the Juncker uh, Commission that also the Moscovici had to bear. And on the rules, when we finish the project, you know, the, the, um, the judgment is, is quite negative on what they did. Basically, they played so much with the rules that the rules don't mean anything uh, anymore. But then COVID comes and uh, on Eurozone reform, all the ideas that, that I could see them uh, debating with each other have become quite useful when the crisis comes to put on the table. And on, on, on the rules, there's a big debate to which uh, you and Eric and other have contributed about whether the rules need to be changed. And that's very much in continuation with, uh, with what they were doing with the kind of sort of intellectual uh, work or discursive work or framing that they were doing. And that's carried by specific individuals. I mean, the people around uh, you know, the current ECFIN commissioner, Paolo Gentiloni, uh, was one of Moscovici's uh, counterparts when he was prime minister uh, in Rome. He's surrounded himself with uh, some of Moscovici's staffers and his uh, chef de cabinet was DJ, as you know, is the director general for economic and financial affairs. And from the several discussions that I had with him, I got the distinct feeling that he was sharing many of the uh, Moscow's views on uh, on fiscal surveillance. So there is definitely, I think, a legacy uh, here. Thanks. I think that's a perfect uh, point to bring Eric Jones in on. So Eric, go ahead. So first, Frederic, the book is really amazing. Very, very good. And and I think <clears throat> uh, I think it does a number of different tricks that that we all can learn from. Um, I'm going to talk about five things really quickly. Um, the first is this notion of politics as depoliticization, because you've got this, this idea of political work as creating space where you can work flexibly. Uh, but as you remind us also at the end of the book, if you, if you make this space too political, then everybody else is going to come and shut it down again. I think that's so important. Um, and that's why I, I, I love the tension between Moscovici's desire to, do, to interpret the rules flexibly so that things can happen and his loathing and, and hatred for populists because he absolutely, like a, like a dog to a bone, right, goes after these populists in ways that makes me, makes me go, oh no, he's gonna lose his room for maneuver. Uh, and, and when you tell the story of Italy, that letter that Marco Butti sent to the Italian government when it was the five-star Lega coalition was a disaster. That was a horrible letter, um, at least received in Italy. And it, and it really made everybody sort of turn against the commission in ways that I thought was very, very unhelpful. Um, and so, so I got a, a clear sense that these guys are politicians but they're also trying to do something else. Politics is a different way. And there's a tension between those two roles. And that brings me to my second point, uh, which is anybody who's interested in principal and agent theory should read this book. Because when you say political work, I hear agency drift. Uh, and, and, and these guys are legitimating their agency drift, right? I hope this book never gets translated into Dutch because every Dutch person who reads it is gonna be like, ah, the commission is this horrible organization that's breaking the rules, right? 
Um, and, and, and not only is it breaking the rules, it's doing so wantonly and looking for opportunities to do that and picking winners along the way. I mean, the story that you tell about Renzi is a classic story in that sense of them saying, well, you know, we kind of like this guy. And so we're gonna give him all the flexibility we can so he can do whatever he wants. And I, I read that and I was like, man, you know, the, the Lego was actually right to hate you guys um, because you really were working against him, um, against them. And so, so I thought that was interesting. And, and this notion of agency drift, I think, uh, leads to my third point, which is that, that institutions matter, right? I mean, thank God it was the European Commission that was responsible for this fiscal surveillance and not the ESM, because I don't think anybody appointed to the ESM would have seen their job in the same way that Moscovici did. I think on the contrary, they would have seen their job very, very differently. And indeed, I think that's why the ESM was created and also why there's so much force being put to get everybody to go to the ESM rather than to the commission if they need assistance. And, and, and I think your argument in that sense underscores the huge significance of next generation EU, because as much as we're all freaked out by how much the commission is getting oversight over these national recovery and resilience plans, the fact of the matter is the alternative was some other institution having that responsibility, and that would have been much worse. Um, I also think you have an important point to make in that context about the ECB. And here in your story about Greece, I think you could have made more out of the fact that the ECB really sets this off by withdrawing the exception that was given uh, to, to Greek sovereign debt for use as collateral in routine liquidity operations. Uh, and, and that sets the stage. And I think you do a good job uh, in, in that context, helping us better to understand the relationship uh, between the commission and Varoufaki. And that's my fourth point. Uh, you've got this great argument that politics is communication. And I suspect that's because you spent a lot of time hanging out with Simon. Um, and <clears throat> and the, this politics is communication is true, but I think the story that you tell about Varoufaki reveals that communication isn't everything, right? There has to be substance underneath it. And, and the insight that you reveal about how much the commission did not believe Varoufaki actually read his dossiers before he went in, that's a really telling insight. And I really like that. I think it, it punctures a lot of the, the energy and the adults in the room story um, that, that Varoufaki has to tell. Um, and in that context about politics uh, as communication, uh, I'm reminded of the many times Moscovici said things that I actually used as the title of articles because they struck me. Uh, and one of them was in the context of the Cyprus crisis where he said, there is no plan B. And I was like, really? Did you say that with your outside voice? Right? Because there has to be a plan B, right? Uh, and then in the context of, of Greece in 2015, when Moscovici came out and said, um, you know what? If Greece leaves the Euro, that could blow up the single currency. And I was like, you're not supposed to say that. You're the guy responsible for this, right? So as much as politics is communication, I, I, I was struck thinking back at, at how loose the communication could be at times. And this brings me to my fifth and final point. Um, I wonder how much the timing of your visits influenced the choice of cases that you had. And the reason that I ask that is because you, you do a great job with the booty letter and the, and the preparation of the budget in Italy in 2018. But the more interesting fight actually took place in the spring of 2019, just after the European parliamentary elections, when the Lega was pushing out this mini bot idea, this idea of small denomination, uh, zero coupon sovereign debt instruments that look a lot like money, but really aren't, right? Um, and, and, and yet you don't really talk about that. You rush through that episode. And I was thinking, you know, I bet he wasn't there then, right? Uh, because if you had been there, trust me, they would have bent your ear pretty viciously uh, uh, over that particular scene. Anyway, that's just my thoughts. It's a great book. Um, anybody who's followed any of this stuff should read the book because it's such a good, good narrative and it turns out to be a ripping yarn. Thanks, Eric. And uh, I'll just so, Frederick, you get a chance to uh, to respond to that for just a few minutes. Well, thank you very much. Oh, first of all, thank you. I don't know what a ripping yarn is, but I'm assuming that's 
kind. Uh, thank you very much, Eric. I think uh, it's I, it, literature. <laughs> no, it's I, I, everything you say, I, 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 I can re relate to. I, you have one question, which is about the timing of the visit. And it, that's an important question because it is a limitation of the project. So uh, for those of you who have read George Ross's book, George uh, spent a year uh, in the, the law cabinet, and then he made a few other visits. But I wanted to do something different, which was to follow um, the entire mandate of the Juncker Commission, so all five years. But the problem is that I have a job, and uh, we don't have five year sabbaticals. So I needed to do um, you know, a lot of short trips, which means that I missed out on many things. So what I would do to kind of complement that was take a lot of you know cafes and be debriefed by uh, by the people who were involved in those files. Th that's how I try to sort of have a, a consistent narrative, but there are moments that are richer and better sourced than others. And they're the moments when I was there. And that's a, clearly a bias, I think, in, in some of the story, but I hope that, you know, it can be, uh, it can be complemented by, by uh, other work that's been done on these, uh, on these different stories. Thanks. So without more ado, uh, Christian, why don't you come in? Yeah, thanks a lot for having me, Jonathan. And uh, thanks a lot for letting me read, read your book, Frederick. And really, congratulations on, congratulations on that. I mean, uh, other people have now praised it so strongly. It's really hard to add something to this. But if you would know me closer, I can make a big compliment because it made me think of a, a classic progressive rap album, actually, and the title of which was Edutainment. And this is exactly what it is. It's you learn a lot, but uh, as Jonathan said, you do not want to put it away. That was really a great read. And I also cannot conceal some envy because especially the first couple of pages reminded me of sitting in the Berlin corridors where I was super nervous, honestly, uh, waiting for the 20 minutes of interview time that I got from cabinet officials. So I'm, I'm envying you a little bit for this, for this long-term embedded perspective that you can provide here. But more substantial, and sorry, Vivian, to invoke a classical battle, but I think uh, your work is really as situated as, as it is uh, a reference point for the question what the commission actually is, right? Classical tensions between this independent technocratic agent of the member states uh, Eric mentioned agency drift or political or at least strongly politicized executives. And, and from my interest in this question, I, I want to raise, I think, three points or three questions to you. And the first one really is what struck me really is the high internal importance of media or the message that the commissioner wants to get out. And I'm coming here from a different angle than Eric just did, because I often criticize the commission for not understanding how much of politics communication actually is. And I mean, if I'm reading your, your presentation of the daily life in the cabinet, the meeting schedules and so on, roughly half of the time seems to be spent on thinking about how to get the message out. But I also want to ask you, to whom are they trying to speak actually? Is it really like, the European citizen or something like this? Or is it just a tool to sort of test the waters with their counterparts in the council or partially also the parliament? So I'm, I'm not sure, I, I wasn't always sure when reading this who the audience actually is for these messages. The second point that irritated me is actually the absence of the services in your book in a way. I mean, DG officials appear here and there, mainly in the taxation chapters, which of course were more legislative in a way. But often we would argue that the main power resources of the commission are sort of the officials intimate knowledge of the acquis communitaire, their long time horizons, uh, leading, uh, leading also to, to Vivian's question of, of lessons learned and how these lessons can be carried through for the commission. And then we also know that many commissioners apparently struggled with giving political direction to their services. I think Günther Verheugen was rather outspoken on that topic, right? That it's hard to control the, the houses of the commission. So I was really wondering, was this a deliberate focus of your analysis or was it the way that the Moscovici cabinet actually worked, right? And then my third and final point goes a bit more to the core of your, of your key research interest the evolution of your idea of political work, which I enjoyed a bit. And it, it was really nice to watch how it evolves throughout the book. If I had to put it in a nutshell, others put it this way, it's, it's about uncovering what kind of agency you have or creating that agency even in, in many of your 
examples against a rather rigid institutional status quo and a rather rigid set of exogenous preferences, where the governments of my country were probably the most rigid, if not authoritarian ones. What I was struggling with, however, and that's a pathology of an the analysis of European decision making often is that the counterparts then often appear as unpolitical or are political even. Right, if I'm thinking about the standoffs with Germany and the IMF in, in your chapters on Greece, for example. And yeah, for me, this is somehow, somehow dissatisfying. And I, I would ra raise one critical question here. Would your story change a lot if you would have called the book The Progressive Commissioner? Isn't this just a story about how to push for progressive ideas on the Brussels scene where the institutional status quo and the preference distribution tends to support, let's say, market liberal or order liberal views. Would that, is that the story that you are telling? Thanks a lot, but, but I enjoyed the book really, and I can really recommend it, and I will recommend it. I'm quite sure about that. Thanks, Frederic. I'm interested in your, uh, your response. Yeah, well, th th thank you very much, Christian. In a way, your questions, and that's not surprising given that you work on the on, on uh, big databases, and I work on an N of basically one, are to what extent uh, are the Moscovici's representative of anything, or to what extent can we draw inferences from, from what I observed uh, in the Moscovici cabinet? Um, so I'll try to answer the three questions, but um, it is clear to me that the story that I tell, and that's a conscious decision on my part, uh, is about uh, Moscovici, I made the conscious uh, decision not to uh, draw a full picture of what was going on because I felt um, that I would be missing on the thick description on the richness of the empirical information, which is what I was interested in. I mean, I did do uh, 80 interviews. I did meet with a lot of people in other cabinets, in other uh, EU institutions and the member states, um, just to you know make sure that I, that I wasn't um, uh, saying anything completely wrong, but it, it's clear that because I follow the Moscovici's so closely, other actors uh, may sound peripheral or uh, I may also, also be biased by the Moscovici's perception of these uh, uh, other uh, actors. And that's you know, just something that I have to acknowledge. Now, I'll start with your third question. Could it be called the progressive commissioner? Um, when I give that presentation in France, uh, no one would buy into the story that Moscovici was a progressive commissioner. I mean, he's considered to be to the right of the Socialist Party, which in France right now means, you know, I don't know what it means, but it doesn't mean progressive necessarily. Um, and so in that sense, um, I think that I, he, he, he was French, he was socialist, but he wasn't only that. Uh, if he were, because then my, my story would only hold for future French socialist commissioners. And there are things that are really uh, typical to, to a French uh, commissioner. I mean, Thierry Breton, in the way that he runs um, his, uh, his, his politics right now, from what I understand, is quite close to uh, Moscovici. Uh, but he's not socialist at all. He's, 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 he's right wing. Um, so, and, and similarly, the fact that you're a progressive or close to the socialist uh, party as a commissioner means uh, certain things. And so, um, you know, for example, Gentiloni, I mentioned it uh, before, has a politics that's probably not very different from uh, the one uh, by Moscovici. But I think that what's really possible to draw lessons from is the idea of doing politics. And here, Moscovici was not the only one. Jean-Claude Juncker definitely was a political president. Um, uh, the, um, someone like Margaret Vestager, despite the fact that she has a very non-political file, she clearly behaves as a political behaved as a political commissioner. Uh, so, so I think this is a more general category of people, as Vivian said, who had the will to do politics, they enjoy doing it. That's why they came to Brussels because they, they actually have a passion. So there's even an emotional, I think, dim dimension to it, but there are all, there's also a set of skills. And here, if we follow EMU politics, 
Uh, no, no offense to uh, Valdis Dombrovskis, but certainly by Western European standards, he doesn't have these political skills, and I'm not sure that he tries to have these political skills either, whether in terms of communication or, or whatnot. Now, how do we see this more concretely? I think that's an answer to your two other questions. First of all, the absence of the services. Uh, I mean, they, 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 I think they're, they're quite there, but they're not my main center uh, of attention. But clearly, uh, Commissioner, Mos Commissioner Moscovici decided that he was leading and the services had to follow, which means that there are fires that he was just utterly uninterested in. And so DG ECFIN could, or you know, VAT, DJ tax suit could do whatever it wanted with the value added tax. That's not something that he was gonna pay a lot of attention to because there was no political dimension to it. And there were issues where, you know, DG ECFIN or DG DG tax just had to do whatever the commissioner and his cabinet had decided that they were going to do. And I think that's important in the context of understanding the European Commission. You know, it's often been portrayed as an organization where uh, the services are extremely powerful and, and the commissioners are almost like placeholders. Uh, clearly, that's not what uh, Moscovici wanted to do, but I think he, he's not the only one in, in that category. And about the media, that's a very interesting question because I mentioned it in the book and that's something that surprised me when I, when I got to Brussels, how traditional their conception of what the public sphere is, uh, how traditional their conception is of what the public sphere is. Um, basically, it's Le Monde, the Financial Times, uh, BBC, Politico increasingly, but it's a very, very uh, Brussels bubble based uh, conception of what the audience is with two, um, two uh, uh, caveats. One is that whenever they wanted to send a message, say, to the Italians, then there was a conscious attempt to speak to the Italian media, but always, you know, La Repubblica, not, not going a, a lot uh, further. So there was a bit of that. And in the case of Moscovici, and it, I'd be interested to see if that's also the case with uh, other commissioners, I suspect it is, he was very, 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 very present in the French media, very present as in several times a week on French radio or in, in a French newspaper. Um, and so the audience was also his, uh, his home country very much.